بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين الله سبحانه وتعالى إن سورة أحزاب نمبر 41 in Surat Ahzab number 41 which you have on the page 4 says Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu dhkurullaha dhikran kathira O those who believe remember Allah as much as you can in abundance or very much, means as much as you can. وَسَبِّحُوهُ بُكْرَةً وَأَسِيلًا And glorify him in mornings and evenings. To remember Allah a lot is something which has been mentioned in many places in the Qur'an, directly or indirectly. For example, in the same surah, Number 35, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the people who would receive forgiveness and great reward from Allah, He says, إِنَّ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَالْمُسْلِمَاتِ This is verse 35. Truly, Muslim men and women, وَالْمُؤْمَنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمَنَاتِ Muslim men and women, faithful men and women, walqanatin walqanatat, humble men and women, wasadiqina wasadiqat, truthful men and women, wasabirina wasabirat, patient men and women, walqashain walqashat, those men and women that have. Uh, soft and humble heart wal mutasaddiqin wal mutasaddiqat those men and women who give charity or seek honesty and truth it can be both was sa'imina was sa'iha sa'imat those men and women who fast wal hafizin who furujahum wal hafizat those men and women who are modest وَالذَّاكِرِينَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا وَالذَّاكِرَاتِ Those men and women who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a lot. أَعَدَّ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةً وَأَجْرًا عَظِيمًا Allah has made ready for them forgiveness and great reward. It is interesting that Allah says your reward if you are, inshallah, one of these groups of people, and inshallah, you are one of all of them, because this can overlap. It says that forgiveness is made ready. Allah has prepared it. It's ready. And reward is ready. It's very important. You know, sometimes you have, a, for example, a small child or grandchild, you say, if you study and get good result, I promise to buy you a bicycle. So he works hard to get the bicycle. But sometimes you say, look, this bicycle is already made ready. It just needs your efforts to make good result. The bicycle is ready. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us, أَعَدَّ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةً وَأَجْرًا عَظِيمًا Forgiveness and great reward are made ready for you. There is no need that later on Allah makes efforts to make, the, make them ready for you. It's already ready, just depends on your efforts. The other beautiful thing in this ayah is the emphasis that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts 
on the fact that whether be a man or woman doesn't make difference as far as the possibility of perfection is concerned, as far as the possibility of getting close to Allah is concerned. So much Allah emphasizes Muslimin, Muslimat, Mu'minin, Mu'minat, Qanatin, Qanatat, as we explained. So no man or woman should feel that he or she has no chance of receiving the gift of forgiveness, the gift of great reward, and on top of everything, closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other thing which relates to our discussion is the emphasis on dhikr, on the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Although Allah has mentioned important qualities like iman, being faithful, being humble, being honest, truthful, patient, all these good qualities, being modest, fasting, but still Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala singles out and mentions kathiran those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a lot. And this relates to the quantity of dhikr. Remember Allah as much as you can. As you know, and maybe I mentioned once, there is a hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made a limit for everything other than dhikr. Praying, fasting, hajj, even giving sadaqah to people has limit. For example, for giving sadaqah, Allah says, don't give that much that you yourself then face problem and don't give too little. Not too much, not too little. Always strike a balance. But about dhikr, there is no limit. So this is about quantity. Also, we have emphasis on quality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I, unfortunately I don't remember the reference, I forgot to check for you the reference, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the people who go to Hajj after performance of the wajibat in Arafat and then in Mash'ar, one of the things which is very important is remembrance of Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Udhkurullah kathikrikum aba'akum aw ashadda dhikra. Remember Allah in the same way that you remember your fathers. In the time of Jahiliyyah, in the time of ignorance, people used to gather in, for example, Mena and talk about their fathers and, you know, the great things that their fathers did to just be proud of their family background. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, instead you must remember Allah in the way that you remember your father, how much they were, you know, proud of their fathers and with full respect and, you know, joy talking about their fathers. Allah says you must remember him like this. Aw ashadda dhikra. Or even greater than this. So this is a matter of quality of dhikr. Sometimes you remember something Two times, three times, ten times, hundred times, this is about quantity. But sometimes you remember things in different ways according to the quality. For example, you go to Ziara. People say, you know, please remember us there. Starting from your children, your husband or wife, parents, friends. Okay? Then you go, inshallah, for example, to Masjid al Nabi, and then you remember them. Some people you remember them every time. 
Some people, you may remember them once in all your journey. So this is about quantity. But when you remember people, then again you remember them in different ways. For example, you remember <coughs> your child or your mother or your father or your husband or your wife in a very a strong way. You feel as if they are with you. But, you know, a moment who has just asked you to pray for me, maybe you don't remember him that strong. Yeah? So there is a possibility of remembering, but at the same time remembering in different levels. When we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we must remember him more than anything else. Not just in quantity, but also in quality. In the same way that you remember yourself. How strongly we remember ourselves. In the same way or even more we should remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? We will talk about the effect inshallah later on. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to remember him as much as possible and as strong as possible. Now for this reason... We want to, inshallah, explore the relation between dhikr and light. Before I start, I just want to quickly review what we said about different types of light. If you remember, we said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the source of light. And then everything created has light. Allah nuru samawati wal earth. He is the light of the heavens and earth. This under, from this we can understand that heavens and earth have light. But this light comes from the original and the source of the light which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bi nur wajhika alladhi adaa'a lahu kullu shay. Bi ismika alladhi ashraqat bihi samawati wal ardh. Anyway, everything as we discussed has some light and there are different levels of light. But then we said, as far as human beings and jinns are concerned, this light is subject to increase or decrease. And then we said we want to focus on this light, not the light which every creature has been given. Not the light which every even human being is given by birth, free of charge. That is not our concern. Our concern is that type of light that we can achieve or God forbid we may lose. So we talked about the transition from darkness to the light or God forbid from light to the darkness. In the previous session I talked about Iman, about faith being a very important source of light. And we mentioned ayat from Surat Hadid and Surah Talaq about the condition of Mu'mineen on the Day of Judgment, where they, when they have light and those who lack faith, they don't have light. The other source of light are good a'mal, righteous deeds, al-a'mal as saliha good deeds. What is good deed? What is the definition of amal salih According to the Quran, a righteous deed or a good deed needs two conditions. The act by itself must be good. It must produce good outcomes. But also, the doer of the act must be doing this with good intention. So first is act itself, second is the doer, and the doer must do it with good intention. The act must be good because it's quite possible that sometime you have good intention, but instead of doing something good, you do something bad, you harm people. This is not amal saleh For example, if with good intention, I undertake a job that I am not qualified for. 
For example, I see someone is ill. With good intention, I ask him you know, to eat something. And then that person, you know, gets sick. Is this amal saleh No. Or, you know, I want to, for example, educate people Islamically, but my own knowledge is limited. And then I misguide people. This is not amal saleh No matter how good was my intention. The act itself must be good. But if I do something good, without good intention, this is also not amal saleh Like what? Like doing something either without intention or with bad intention. Without intention, like when I am sleeping, if I say something and then someone learns something, this is not useful for me because I was sleeping, I didn't have any intention. Or for example, you know, when I do something like, for example, you know, I give food to the people, but without having the good intention, just I give it to the people. This doesn't help me. This is not amal saleh because I don't have intention. Or if I have intention, but it is bad, I want to show off. I want to be praised by people. I want to have respect from the people i want to attract them for example you know a shopkeeper who treats his customers and clients with respect and gives them very good price but just to sell more this is not amal saleh but if you treat people with respect because of good intention then that is amal saleh so amal saleh needs the act itself to be good and the doer also do it with intention which is good then here we have a detailed discussion a very technical discussion about what types of intentions are good for sure if you seek the pleasure of allah is good but there is possibility of also maybe saying, and this is my view, that if you do something because you find it to be good, this is also, I think, also good. But maybe not as rewarded as when you do it for the sake of Allah. For example, if I see there is a poor person and I help him because I believe that helping a poor is good. I think this is by itself a good intention. But if I do it for the pleasure of Allah, it's much better, much, much better. But just doing something because you find it right to do, I think this by itself would be uh, rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have lots of evidence for that. That even if kuffar do something with good intention, Allah will take that into account. Like Hatam Ta'i, who was a generous person in the time of Jahiliyyah, and for sure, he didn't do this for the sake of God because he didn't believe in God. But still, we have respect for him because of showing generosity honestly and genuinely to the people. And according to some hadith, he would not be punished. He, he would not be able to go to heaven because he doesn't have faith. But he would be exempted from going to hell. And also the Prophet treated his children with respect just because of their father. And we have many hadiths about this. So, if you do something because as a human being you find this is right, so you do it with the intention of doing something moral, something right, I think this by itself would be rewarded, but it's better if we do it for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, when we do, on top of faith, every righteous deed, this would increase our light. Whether it be an act of worship, like praying, or fasting, or going for Hajj, or even making Wuzu. Because Wuzu by itself, as we said, 
is light. Al wuzu o nuron, wal wuzu ala al wuzu nuron, ala nur. Fasting, Hajj. I don't remember if I mentioned this hadith, beautiful hadith, that when someone comes back from Hajj, go and kiss his forehead or her forehead before he commits sins. Because when someone performs Hajj, he has a light. When people go back, then they start committing sin, that light goes away. So before it gets too late, go and visit them so that still the light is there. And this is different from seeking light or borrowing light in Akhirah. In dunya, if someone has light and you pay a visit to him to seek light, you will receive light. But in Akhirah, if someone has light and I don't have light, I cannot borrow light from that person in Akhirah. But in dunya, I can by performing a good act like visit. Visiting a mu'min by itself is a worship, as an act of worship. Sometimes, you know, when uh, I'm not in town and I go back, some people say, they think that I have been to Umrah or Ziyara or this and that. Uh, uh, may Allah accept your Ziyara. And then they say, have you been to Ziyara? So they first say, and then they, uh, I said, I've been to the Ziyara of Mu'minin. I was given the tawfiq to do Ziyara of Mu'minin. This by itself is a great achievement to do Ziyara of Mu'minin. So, Ziyara in dunya with the intention of strengthening your relation with mu'mineen and knowing what is happening to them and see if you can do any help this by itself is great about and it has light so any amal saleh any righteous deed generates light and depending on their significance the light would be different there is a beautiful dua after ziyarat ali yasin I mentioned uh, once the expression kalimat nurik about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu in the beginning of that dua. You know, after ziyarat al yasin there is a dua. Allahumma inni as'aluka an tusalli ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam nabiy rahmatik wa kalimat nurik. Oh Allah, I ask you to send your salutation to the Prophet Muhammad, who is the Prophet of mercy and the word of light. Okay? We discussed about this previously. But after that, we seek light for ourselves. This is very important. This passage is very important because it helps us to understand that different aspects of our being can receive light and also what type of light. Oh Allah, please fill my heart with the light of certainty. A heart which is full of doubt is dark in this aspect. Certainty or yaqeen is very important. And when you have yaqeen, your power increases. If you have great champion of, for example, wrestling or running or weightlifting or whatever, but if such a great person has doubt about what to do, his power is not working. He becomes weak and weak. But he, if he has yaqeen that he must do something, then he can mobilize all his power. A human being who is in doubt can never make a firm decision, can never put all his energy into one thing. Doubt is very bad. It's good only to begin with. Doubt is good to make you 
motivated to study, to learn, to ask. This is good. But it is not good as a station. It's good just as a transient situation. Yaqeen is one of the greatest gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to achieve. Yaqeen. And the only way to achieve Yaqeen, real Yaqeen and certainty, is to increase your knowledge with Ibadah. وَعَبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَكَ الْيَقِينَ Worship your Lord even until or till. It depends how you interpret this. You receive certainty. So it's not just a matter of reading the books. You may read hundreds of books on existence of God but without actually worshipping Allah that certainty doesn't come this is not what some other faith communities say some other faith communities they feel that there is no way to prove God or religion rationally so they say believe and then you accept or believe and then you understand. Mm -hmm. We don't say like that. We say every person has first rationally to prove for himself the truth of religion. But what I'm saying is that after you prove that your religion is right and correct, after you prove that God is there, you need to worship God to establish that belief and make it certain. This certainty is very important. I always remember the story of that young companion of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina, who was one of the people of platform, Ashab Sufi. Sufi was like a platform in Masjid al-Nabi, or actually outside Masjid, now it is inside the Masjid. And on this platform, some people used to live from Mecca, who had migrated to Medina, but they had no houses. So they were basically just living their simple life, and they wanted to be close to the mosque. So they were living there. One day after Fajr prayer, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with a group of his companions was passing by this platform and he saw this young man the prophet realized that he is in a special state so ask him Kaifa asbahd? how are you today how did you start your day he said asbahtu munqinan I started my day while I am certain. Mukhin is someone who has certainty, yaqeen. The Prophet said, everything has a sign. What is the sign of your certainty? He said, my certainty has caused me not to sleep. I cannot sleep. My certainty has caused me not to be able to eat and drink during the day. And I am able to see hell and heaven. And I can see which one of these people who are with you are in hell and which are in heaven. Because you know, hell and heaven are already there. Each of us now are either in hell or heaven. But this is not yet fixed. It will be fixed and finalized on the Day of Judgment. But already we are in temporary hell and heaven. So maybe now I am in heaven. After one minute, I do something, I go to hell. So we are always either in hell or heaven. And this is the Quran. 
كلا لو تعلمون علم اليقين لترون الجحيم if you had the knowledge of certainty you would have certainly seen the hell right now and this person had this certainty and he told the prophet i can see which one of these people are in hell which are in heaven the prophet asked him to keep silent because these things are not to be disclosed if they were supposed to be disclosed the prophet himself could, would have told this to the people then this man asked the prophet please pray i become martyr because you know if you have such a state you cannot really live you know you want to go soon so that you don't lose this so the prophet prayed for him and he soon became martyr so this is certainty this is yaqeen so we shouldn't underestimate the gift of yaqeen we shouldn't think that we all have this yaqeen the ulama have beautiful examples and analogy to explain different levels of knowing something sometimes you know we see a smoke coming to the sky from behind a wall so when you see the smoke you realize that there must be a fire because this is an effect and must have a cause so you are sure that there must be a fire but when you go to the other side of the wall and you see yourself the fire now your knowledge is different this is a higher level of knowledge and if you go and put your finger in that fire just to feel it and when it's a bit burnt then your knowledge about fire is the strongest so sometimes we have ilm al yaqeen and that is when you see the fire and you know that there must be sorry you know you see the smoke and you know that there must be fire this is ilm al yaqeen sometimes you go and see the fire by yourself this is ain al yaqeen and sometimes you go and burn your finger or the fire burns your finger this is haqq al yaqeen haqq al yaqeen this is the most you can say truthful or you know it's the perfect certainty allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says كلا لو تعلمون علم اليقين لترون الجحيم even if you had the first type of certainty you would have been able to see the hell then it says ثم لا ترونها عين اليقين inshallah later you would see it by your eyes and then inshallah when you go to heaven and you start enjoying yourself in heaven that that would be haqqul yaqeen so we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fill our heart with the light of yaqeen and tamla qalbi nur al yaqeen wa sadri nur al iman to O oh Allah please fill my breast with the light of iman. Wa azmi nur al ilm and my determination with the light of knowledge. You know when we make a decision when we are determined to do something if there is no knowledge this decision is not right because we are making this without knowledge so we are making mistake we say oh allah please fill my decisions and decision making process 
with the light of knowledge. So I make decisions out of knowledge. The light of knowledge makes your decisions appropriate. Vaqawwati nur al amal. Very beautiful. Please feel my strengths, my power with the light of acting. What does it mean? We have power, but when we don't act, this power is dark. When you act, your power would be turned in at your service. You know, if I can do something good and I do it, then my power would be enlightened. It means that I can do more and more and with less difficulties. If I have power and I don't act using my power, my power is darkened. It means that it cannot be used properly. Vallesani Nura Sedq. Please feel my tongue with the light of truth. Two people speak. One of them speaks the truth, one of them tells the lies. The one who speaks the truth, his tongue has light. The one who tells lies, his tongue is dark. And therefore, the one who speaks truthfully can have great impact on the audience. Because this word which comes from his mouth, out of his mouth, is a word of light. But if it's lie, it doesn't have that light. This is the spiritual effect of the words that people utter. We don't understand. We just listen to the verbal aspect. Sometimes the one who tells lies speaks even more beautifully, more eloquently. Yeah? But the heart is different. If someone speaks when he himself believes that what he says is true and with honesty says something, that can change. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was reciting the Quran and many people just by listening to him embraced Islam. Why? Why if we recite the same Quran, even if the best Egyptian or you know any other types of reciters recite the Quran, it doesn't have the effect that the recitation of the Prophet had. Was it because the Prophet was reciting with more skills and techniques of Tajweed and Talawa? Or it was because of the impact of the light of the Prophet, which without our knowledge is coming through the mouth and through the word, and then settles in the heart of the people. The pagans were so worried about just people listening to the prophet without talking to them, you know, just listening to the recitation, not having conversation, just about that. So they used to say not to go and do tawaf around Kaaba when he is there. Or put cotton, some cotton in your ears, so that when he is reciting the Quran, you don't listen. They were so much frightened that people just listen to the recitation of the Quran, of the Prophet. They did their best to scatter people. They said he is mad, he is magician, he is taught by foreigners, everything they said. And it is amazing that these, you know, 
accusations, they conflict with each other. If someone is mad, so how can he say something that even the rational people cannot bring something like that? How can a mad person beat all the rational people? So they were doing their best to scatter people. But the leaders of Quraysh themselves could not resist the temptations of loving to hear the recitation of the Prophet. They were his enemies. But the word of the Quran coming from the mouth of the Prophet, which is word of light, Chalemat Nurek, it's a light coming out of light. So when the Prophet recites the Quran, is light coming out of light, then it's so attractive that even his enemies could not resist. So when it was dark night, they used to go and sit outside the house of the Prophet and hide themselves. And for maybe hours, Listen to the Prophet. One day, when it was bright, and they wanted to leave because they were worried, you know, so they had to evacuate the place, they met each other. And they didn't know that the others whole night were there. So they met each other, and then they f felt ashamed that we ask everyone not to listen to him. Now we have been all here. What would people say if they realized that we have been here? So they promised each other that this must be the last time. Then the next night, everyone thought that others would not come. So they went again and they saw each other and again they promised. Then this, this happened the third night. Then the third night, they made very far you know, decision. They made vows that we don't come again. This is the attraction of truth. And you know, truth is not just a matter of telling something which is true. You remember uh, yeah, I think it was in the other series of lectures, it was not here. When we talked about truthfulness, sometimes I tell something which is true. But still, I am not truthful. You must tell the truth and you must believe in what you say. If I say there is hell and there are hell and heaven, this is true. But if I don't believe and I say something just to please you, I am not truthful. And I mentioned this example of munafiqeen, the hypocrites. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ قَالُوا نَشْهَدُ إِنَّكَ لَرَسُولُ اللَّهِ When the munafiqeen come to you, they say, we bear witness that truly you are the messenger of God. Is this true or not? The Prophet was the Prophet of God, so this is true. The statement is true. Allah says, Wallahu ya'lamu inna kala rasuluh. Allah knows that you are his apostle. Wallahu yashhadu inna al-munafiqeen ala kathabun. But Allah bears witness that the hypocrites are not truthful. Because what they say, they don't believe. If I recite the Quran, Quran is true. But if I don't believe in what I recite, so this is not a truthful recitation. Or if I believe that that is true, but I don't practice myself. Again, this is not a truthful and honest recitation. It doesn't have effect. I tell you not to do backbiting and then I do it myself. So what I said was true. I also believe that is to be true, but I don't practice it. Still, it doesn't have that effect. So... If I am a truthful person, then the light 
of truthfulness affect my tongue, my words. Vadini nur al basair min andek. Please fill my religion, means my faith, means my religiosity, with the light of insights coming from you. This is very important. The problem in this world, although there are many people who don't believe in religion, there are atheists, but I think the bigger problem is that there are many religious people who have no insights. There is no basira, there is no insight. They do something, and maybe sincerely, but more than they, you know, bring good, they do, you know, facade, they make mischief. To have insight is very important. To have the vision of what we are to do in any circumstances, under any circumstances, in any case. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked by Allah to explain his strategy in tabliq. What was the strategy of the Prophet in tabliq? Qul ad'u ila Allah ala basira Ana waman tabani. Tell, I call people towards Allah. I invite people towards Allah. I call them towards Allah with insight, in an insightful way. And those who follow me, waman tabani, and those who follow me would do the same. So we must realize that how we invite people towards Allah in every context. Can we invite Allah to the, uh, can we invite people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the same way that I used to do it in my local village? Can I do it in the same way in a, for example, in the West? Is it the same way of doing the same thing? We must have the basira, we must have the insight. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give me insight in my faith. Vabasari nuradhiya. Oh Allah, please give my eyes, my vision, the light. The light comes to your eyes and then you can see the truth. You can see what is good, what is bad. Vasamri Nur al Hikmah. Please fill my ears with the light of wisdom. If your ears have the light of wisdom, then they can understand the truth. There are people who listen hours and hours and hours and they don't understand the truth. And they don't want to understand the truth. There are people who listen a very short talk and they get the whole point. Because there is wisdom here. وَمَوَدَّتِي نُورَ الْمُوَالَاتِ لِمُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِهِ عَلَيْهِمُ السَّلَامِ And my love, my affections, even we are taught to ask light for our love and affection. The light of loving the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt. If you have the light of loving the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt, then your feelings, your emotions would become enlightened. Then you know whom you should love and whom you shouldn't love. What type of life you should love, what type of life, life you shouldn't love. Everything would be enlightened and guided. 
حتى القاك please do all this with me till I meet you so this is one of the beautiful passages in our du'as about light now if you want to make a very comprehensive analysis about different types of acquired light, we can say it comes from Iman, it comes from performance of good acts, it comes from having good qualities of the heart or soul, and it comes from remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And gradually, I will explain that all this indeed go back to the remembrance of Allah. Even faith goes back to remembrance of Allah. Performance of good deeds goes back to remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me recite just two, three verses so that you can reflect, so that inshallah we continue tomorrow. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks in the Quran about the significance of remembrance of Allah in very clear language, in very simple way, so that everyone can understand. In addition to some of the verses that we have recited so far, we can refer to some new verses. One is the verse 124 up to 126 of Surah Taha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ أَعْرَذَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ذَنْكَ Whoever turns away from my remembrance. This is beautiful. He doesn't say whoever doesn't remember me. He says whoever turns away from my remembrance. What does it mean? It means that the default state is to remember. You know, Araz in Arabic means that you have some condition and you want to change it. For example, you know, something very common is if you have been living or you have bo been born in a city and a town and it has become like, like your vatan, means your place of residence, permanent residence, your salat is complete, you can fast, okay? But then our fuqaha discuss about i'raz. So if I used to live always in a city, and then I say, I want to change my place of residence, and I never want to go back to that city. This is called i'raz. means you are shifting away from that city. And then if you do this, then whenever you go back for any reason, you know, to that city, your salat is qasr. And you cannot fast. But then here ulama disagree whether the intention it itself is enough or you must do something practical, then I don't want to go to details. But this is i'raz. So Allah says, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ So dhikr, remembrance of Allah is like the original condition. If you do i'raz, if you turn away from my remembrance, فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ذَنْكَ Then he would have a very difficult and a stressful life. Because when you love Allah and you remember Allah, everything else becomes insignificant. You know, someone who has very great aim in his life. He is ready to cope with all difficulties because he has very great ideal aim in his life. Yeah? 
a student who wants to become very, for example, you know, advanced in his study, he's ready not to eat, not to drink, not to sleep, go to library and spend time there, you know, work hard to buy a book. He's doing all these difficult things with joy because he has some ideal which is very important for him. Anything else becomes not important. When we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His greatness so much fills our heart that anything else becomes insignificant and we would be able to take any, uh, you know, suffering, any pain, any trouble so that we can please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without pain that much. There is a, a little pain, but the pain even becomes less. But with joy, it's interesting. You do something painful with joy. Like, you know, when you are going to Hajj, it's very difficult sometimes to throw stones. It's very difficult. Sometimes, you know, physically you are, you know, even hurt. But you do it with joy. Yeah? Even if you had to walk all the way from your tents, you know, to... Uh, Jamarat, under, you know, hot, you know, sun, and then be squeezed, and sometimes, you know, be heat, but still, you feel very happy, and you don't regret. And again, after you have performed your wajib has, next year you say, I want to go. It's not wajib. Why you are going? Because I have realized the beauty of Hajj. Whether it is wajib or not, it makes no difference. I want, love Hajj because it makes me closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So sometimes we do difficult tasks, but we don't feel sad. We do it with happiness. We do it with joy. Yeah? So those who turn away from my remembrance, they would have painful and difficult and stressful life. And we will re uh, revive them on the day of judgment blind. On the day of judgment, he is resurrected blind. He thinks maybe there was a mistake. I was supposed to be able to see he, said, he thinks maybe there was a mistake so now he says please you know correct I was supposed to be blind not to be blind I was able to see now I am blind why you received our signs, our messages, but you kept forgetting. Now you are forgotten. So now you realize that there is a sense in which you can say God also forgets. If you forget God, then God forgets you. In a sense, not in the sense that he would not be knowing what you are doing. In the sense that he doesn't pay a special attention to you. If you remember him, you, he remembers you. If you forget him, he forgets you. Very simple. And you know, God is so merciful that he always adjusts himself according to what we do. <laughs> he says... You want me to remember you? Remember me. You want me not to remember you? So don't remember me. So there is a special remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the remembrance of care and support and guidance that would be given only to the people who remember him. If we don't remember him, 
In dunya, we would have terrible life. In akhirah, would be even worse. To begin with, you would be blind. But just this is the beginning. And there's much more to come. Inshallah, we would follow this discussion. And we have also beautiful hadith about dhikr. And the, the fact that dhikr gives light. So inshallah tomorrow we will put these verses and hadith together inshallah. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. So again if you have your discussions for 20-25 minutes and then inshallah we will continue. And those who are in hurry you know they can always leave.